Thank you, thank you everyone. I'll try to do in English, try to do my best with that. I'm going to talk about uh, the thing we are, the work we are doing with historical ecology, which just to a quick something like definition, just to put something, is the, uh, the use of historic and prehistoric information to understand both old or contemporary ecosystems and often with a conservation point of view for contemporary conservation. Uh, most of the research on historical ecology has some things in common, which is the focus on applied issues, usually uh, restoration and conservation, the interdisciplinarity approach, there are people working from different areas, scientific areas working together, and that basically all studies on historical ecology assumes humans as an important part of the ecological patterns, which is uh, more and more introducing general ecology, but not a common feature for uh, general ecology, and it is for historical ecology. So why it's important to study historical ecology? Is, I could go on for, uh, for a while on that, but I all only put two examples. One, one is because the past determines the present, so how things were in the past uh, determine how they are now. And a nice example I like a lot is the, the Maya area in which to, what today is southeastern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize. Uh, uh, there was a, the development of the Maya culture that was a very, uh, a very important culture producing lots of monuments, but there is a very uh, uh, impressive pattern of the rate of monument construction because there is a huge crash of the Maya civilization some uh, 12 centuries ago that is apparently related to deforestation and environmental crisis because by that time the human population there was thought to be something like a present day Netherlands or something like that. It's a hugely populated area. So the civilization as such uh, collapsed, not the culture, they, the people still are there with the languages and so on. But uh, the thing is that uh, before the arrivals of Spanish to, the, to, to America, the area was quite deforested, or some 1,000 years ago it was quite deforested. It, when the Spanish people arrived there and in the invasion and so on, it was again a forested place, so with a lot of uh, rainforest. So if we didn't have that information on what the space looked like before, we could have thought that the rainforest there is pristine, and the case it is not, it is a rather new rainforest. Uh, now it is again becoming uh, deforested with pre uh, modern deforestation, but even in the present day, it's, uh, it is, the area is thought to have more forest than it had uh, 1,000 years ago or 12 centuries ago. And the other thing is that knowing uh, the past, uh, it's useful to plan for conservation in the present, I am presenting here the work of Lauren McLenachan with photographs from a fish contest in Florida. Uh, there is a, I don't know the city, but it is a fish contest that happens every year. And there was a guy taking photos to the prices of the contest for a long time, it has a long time series. This is the photo for 57, the photo for the year 80, and the photo for 2007. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is that uh, there is a clear reduction in uh, size of fish, and we can uh, estimate how the size has declined since 57 because we have the photograph, but we could not have had this photograph. So maybe we uh, started the photograph in 80. We still have a, a, a reference for the declining fish size, but our reference would be an already uh, 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 an already shink fish fauna, so an already degraded state. So if we have the reference in a, if we put our conservation reference in a moment where the ecosystem is already degraded, we would have something that is got to be named as the shifting baseline syndrome. So it's good that we have information from, uh, from past, as, as far in the past as we can, to uh, not fall in this uh, shifting baseline syndrome which is anyway inevitable because uh, by the 57, the fish fauna there was probably already affected by overfishing and those sizes that seem very big now were not 
as big as in the original situation. <coughs> so I, what I'm going to present is historical uh, uh, ecology studies using written sources. Uh, we have seen an example with paleo uh, ecology, uh, mainly with palynology and so on. This with photographs, but I use mainly written sources that are not very prestigious about, um, for, for ecologists in general. This is a text written, in fact, by an historical ecologist, probably working with pollen or whatever, that <laughs> doesn't trust anything about written text. And ecologists usually, usually trust people which come from the natural sciences, such as Joseph Grinnell, which uh, Joseph Grinnell received uh, a lot of money uh, from a donation to the university, and he was a real visionary guy, so he decided to, to make ecological or biodiversity surveys, not, not called biodiversity by them, but, but uh, ecological surveys, with the idea that they could be replicated 100 years later. So that's what the people in the Green Elbow Survey project are doing, and they are doing amazingly well, and they have a impressive data and so on. There's also the data from Humboldt, that is so detailed that can, they can be replicated 2,200 years later. But in most places on Earth, we don't have Grinnell and we don't have Humboldt. So we have to trust, uh, or we have to use the information that was produced by people outside the natural sciences. And most of the information comes from bureaucratic societies, and the king of bureaucratic societies is China, which has had uh, the, basically the same a country a structure for more than 2,000 years with the same language, with the, with the same functioning and collecting the same documents. So they have this fancy or whatever it said, that they have information for over 2,000 years on a lot of natural phenomena, including biodiversity, but also uh, fr river floods and, and big storms and, and so on. It's really amazing what China has. This is the decline on gibbon, gibbons monkeys in China for, for some 400 years. But then Spain is also quite a bureaucratic country, so we have a lot of information in Spain. And I'm going to show you a couple of uh, very nice examples of uh, information collecting, collecting initiatives in Spain. The first one is from the 16th century. It's called the Relaciones Topográficas. We say Relaciones Topográficas de Felipe II because they were promoted under the kingdom of Philip II. <coughs> and the reason, uh, or the, the Relaciones Topográficas, is a, an initiative to collect information on villages. And the, the reason, the, which is written in the instruction, is that that information didn't exist, so it was a real an information collecting initiative. It also had some taxation aim, but that's not explicitly written in the memory. And uh, there were three different questionnaires issued between 1574 and 1581. The first one was directed to priests, and it was a, a trial in the Coria Bishop in Cáceres, and it didn't work. So the, in the second, the instruction said, send to every village, even if the priests have answered the previous questionnaire, because they didn't trust the priest information. So the, the, the questionnaire was, had to be answered for at least two people that have to sign the, the responses. Uh, the vast majority of them didn't know how to write or read, so, so it was read by the, by the, by the people who, who wrote the answers, and they all confirmed the, the, those answers. And this is the kind of question that is asked about wood fire and animals and what kind of trees, and also what kind of fish, and also uh, what kind of crops they had, and so on. This kind of text I, didn't, I have not put in English because loss loses a lot, but, uh, but basically it asks explicitly about uh, wild fauna and wild vegetation, and, and about crops also. The initiative was a failure because it was thought to be a field for every village in Spain, and they only, only is saying it, they only collected information for something more than 600 villages, which is anyway the best collection of information at the village scale worldwide for the 16th century, probably. There's nothing like that in the world. And it has 
uh, well, the, the original documents are in the Escorial uh, monastery, but they were copied in the 18th century for, by the Academia de la Historia in, in Madrid. So there is a copy that has the advantage that can be read because the documents from the 16th century, we will see some examples later, are very difficult to go through. Uh, there is a, a compilation of information by Ortega from the, 18, uh, from the early 20th century that has been used a lot, but is what this guy thought it was the most interesting. So the best way to go to the, to the relation is go to the transcriptions made by historians, or I, I went through them, or go to the Academia de la Historia, I also went to that to, to, to fulfill the, the missing information. <clears throat> the Relaciones contains over uh, 2,600 records of wild fauna of around 100 species and a lot of records of wild plants and, and crops. Interestingly, there is not a single mention to American crops by that time uh, in, in the area. <clears throat> this is, for example, the distribution of uh, brown bear records at, by that time, or the wild goat was quite... Uh, widespread in, in the area, and it has uh, the last mentions to the to the encebro, which is the wild ass, the last megafauna to go extinct in, in Europe, and it is an impressive testimony because it's very lively of direct people that knew the encebro, that had known the encebro during their lifetime, but say that they have disappeared from the village, and the two villages that uh, mentioned the encebro give the same questions. The people had known the encebro, but they have disappeared. And the, the description is completely amazing, this thing of the, of the yegua cenizosa de color de pelo de rata un poco moinas. Uh, it's so nice how they describe the, the animal. <clears throat> and the second example is the Madovic Dictionary. It's a geographical dictionary following this current of geographical dictionaries from the 18th and 19th century in Europe. It was a huge work directed by that guy, but Pascual Madoz, was a politician and military guy and so on, quite relevant uh, in, in Spanish politics in that time. <clears throat> it is a work that took more than 10 years, published in 16 volumes with 75,000 uh, articles for every single village, every mountain, every river, every stream, every uh, whatever topographical accident in Spain talking about that, and it was a citizen science initiative, in fact, because it has uh, 1,400 direct collaborators, each one of them collected information from his or, well, his, his or her own network, so uh, there was a huge amount of people uh, involved in this information collecting initiative. The amount of information is impressive, there are almost one quarter of million records of a lot of them of wild plants, wild fauna, crops, and, and livestock. <clears throat> I'm going to present some of it about freshwater fish. That is the first studies that we are uh, developing. That is, there are a lot of records, 12,000 for more than around 6,000 localities. So this, what I'm going to do now, go on to some case studies using those data. And the first one deals with the eel, with the European eel. I don't know if you know about the collapse of the of the species. It uh, used to be one of the most abundant and widespread freshwater fish species in, in Europe and Northern Africa. But in the 80s, around the 80s, it, it, its population collapsed. The, the y-axis there is logarithmic, so it is that the population in very few years went to less than 10% of what it was. <coughs> and uh, in fact, even if it is a very abundant species now, it is considered as critically endangered by, by the UCN. And it has, uh, with this situation being an, econom an econom important economic resource in Europe, it has a unique uh, European legislation focused only in the European eel that forces member states to, to, to recover eel populations and establish a specific conservation targets, that is, to permit the escape to the sea of silver eels, that are the eels that are ready to reproduce and go to the Sarcasso Sea, the, the, the legislation says that 40% of the eels 
that would go to the Sargasso Sea in a pristine situation have to uh, be leaving the, the each catchment to the Sargasso Sea. So here there are two difficult things. is knowing how many silver eels are going out from a catchment. That is very difficult, but the most difficult thing is to know how pristine stocks were. It is, we don't know how many eels are leaving the Guadalquivir Basin now to the Sargasso Sea. We do have not a single idea of how many silver eels went in the uh, 19th century to the Sargasso Sea. So our idea here was to change the abundance targets to uh, geographical targets. So we could try to recover the original distribution of the eel. So we went to the 19th century and collect the eel information in the Madoz. There are almost 3,000 records. And we followed this uh, approach to define presences and absences. So the, we have the SARS, the, we have information with uh, localities with no information on fish, okay, they let them. Then we have information mentioning fish, but some of the localities only mention fish in general. We don't use that neither. And some localities mention fish by specific names. So they, they mention eel, they mention trout, they mention salmon, barbel, nace, whatever. So those are the localities that we use to define presence absence. So an absence of an eel is a locality that says that it has trout or barbel or whatever, but does not mention eel. And we tag that information to the soup catchment, and with this information we can model the suitability of the Iberian Peninsula for the eel in the mid-19th century. And using contemporary data, we are compared with present-day situation, which is something like that. So it is a huge geographical collapse of the species, and our idea was to use this information as a reference to plan the recovery of the geographical uh, range of the species. We also used the 16th century data from the Relaciones to, to, to see if the reference scenarios between the 16th century and the 19th century matches, and, or match it, and they match quite well, so the, we use this as a reference a scenario, and then we have this map, which is the distribution of large dams in Spain, and the brown area is the area that is not accessible for any fish coming from the sea. <coughs> and we can superpose that to the suitable area for the eel in our reference map. And our idea was, uh, our question was, on how many dams should we act to recover a given uh, amount of suitable area for the eel? So. To recover 40%, we should uh, make permeable 12 dams. To recover 60%, we should rec make permeable 12 dams, uh, 20 dams. And to recover 80, we should go to 26 large dams. Of course, that's not very easy because we have dams like that. That it's very difficult to make permeable upstream, but it's completely impossible to make permeable downstream. So uh, uh, we should introduce other things in the in the in the in the our optimization uh, protocol such as the description of the dam <coughs> a second example deals with the brown trout we have uh, and climate change is a climate sensitive species dependent on cold water so we took the information from the 19th century from the madoz uh, in the upper map and the present day situation and we can have a, a, a map of changes in the distribution with as, as, uh, cells in which the species have disappeared, cells in which the species have been always absent, always present, and cells in, in which there was no trout information in the 19th century and we have now. Many of those are uh, stocking areas, so, so they are difficult to interpret, these colonizations. <coughs> we also made a temperature scenario for the 19th century in fact, from the early 20th century, but uh, we see that the changes in the temperature are not homogeneous in the whole territory, and that the changes have been more uh, relevant for summer temperatures that have rise more than in winter. And what we see here is that the cells in that in which the, the trout have become extinct uh, have intermediate uh, temperature changes between the absence and the present cells. So that uh, is especially because of the temperature in July, which is seen large temperatures 
changes in July, that large increases in summer temperature seem to have uh, driven the extinction of, of trout in many cells. And what we, what we did was uh, do the standard approach in climate change predicting uh, distribution shifts that is saying, okay, we have this distribution now, let's project it to 2070 and see what it looks like. I'm sure that I will be dead in 2070, so I don't care about my projection. So our idea here is, okay, we have the 19th century information, so we can project it to present day situation. This is a projection. And we can model present day situation, which is this one, and compare it. It fits more or less quite well. So uh, uh, the slope is one and so on. And it is have some strange shape in that, but okay, so uh, it seems that it works, even geographically, not only, uh, not only in, the, in the regression, but the reduction in, in the distribution fits quite well in the two periods, so we are quite confident that we can now project for the future, and we get that between the mid-19th century and the mid-21st century, we would have a, something like 40%, uh, 45% in suitability for the trout in Spain. Okay, then these are only examples on single species, but our, our next steps with the Madoz are modeling uh, habitats and land uses, and also interaction with humans, introducing human population. And these are only some examples from the, well, in fact, it's from the 16th century and uh, 19th century for some species. We can model the distribution. And our idea then is use some multivariate approach to mix all those distribution of uh, uh, vegetation and also crops and so on to make, to produce land cover maps or land use maps. And these are also for crops. This is the wine wine production in the 16th and 19th century. Uh, and this is silk, the below is silk production. That is quite similar between the two data sets. <coughs> and this is, this is uh, the work uh, to come with, the, with this data. But I wanted also to introduce other kind of data that, that are not based on that much structured sources, but much more difficult to, to go into the sources. And one of those are the archives. We have a huge amount of archives in Spain, uh, starting with this guy again, with uh, Felipe II. It is, uh, he was something like a psychopath for uh, uh, documentation. So everything it was done in the kingdom was documented and had to be filtered by him personally. So it was a, a very hard working administration, but all the papers are saved and all are stored in archives so they can be studied. <clears throat> uh, while he was young, he was taken through Europe by his father, uh, Carlo V, Carlo I, whatever, so uh, to know that the Spanish territories in Central Europe, in Italy and, and, the, and Flanders and so on. And there he knew the, the garden. He was uh, quite uh, impressed by the gardening in Central Europe and he decided that he wanted to introduce this kind of gardening and animal gardens in Spain. So he planned the City of Reales uh, architecture, trying to imitate the uh, uses in Italy and Central Europe. F to that aim, he first tried with Spanish gardeners and they didn't do well because they were trained in, in producing fruits and he basically, Felipe II basically get rid of every fruit in the palaces. He wanted only the correct plants for decoration and he brought gardeners from Central uh, Europe, from the Netherlands. And there are these two guys that are relevant for the story I'm going to tell, that is uh, Peter Janssen, called El Diquero, or El Holandés, and then Adrial Der Molen, which is uh, El Flamenco. <coughs> uh, that we have a lot of information is very good, makes things easy, but the bad thing is that the information looks like this. <laughs> so, so this is called a billete, which is the way that the uh, workers for the, uh, for the king communicated with the king. This part is written by a guy and left this part of the document empty. 
So this part is written directly by Felipe II. This is the, the letter of Felipe II is amazing, so, so difficult to go into it. Uh, so so it, was, it works like a, a changes controlling work. In, in Word document, so it, the, this document went uh, go uh, to one place and back for could go for several times with uh, more annotation on it. <coughs> so I'm using this. I'm going to tell you a story about some freshwater fish introduction or freshwater animal introduction in the 16th century. It started with uh, Felipe II writing to Gabriel de la Cueva, which was the Virrey of Navarra by that time, and saying that. Uh, Peter Hansen, which was already working uh, in the court, had made two pools and he wanted carps in the pools. So uh, he had heard that in Bayona in France they had carps, so he asked this Virrey to go there, but he didn't answer. So he tried another strategy and then wrote to Cardinal Granvela, which was, was the strongman of Felipe II in Flanders by that time, and asked him for a, a lot of things in, uh, to bring from, from Flanders. One of the things is that he wanted a maestro of building pools and managing fish, fish, and that he should be able to deal with carp, brujetes, and alcrevices. And this is very nice because brujetes is the Spanish transformation of brochet, the, the name in French for pike, and alcrevices is the Spanish adaptation of the word ecrevi, that is the uh, French word for crayfish. So uh, they are basically putting the, the names as they, as they sound in French to, to Spanish. <clears throat> so he said to Cardinal Gambella that before, that the guy, that the maestro that goes from Flanders to Spain while passing through France he should guess wh where he could get carps, uh, crayfish and pikes. And even uh, he asked if these animals could be taken directly from Flanders. The, he was informed that it, that was not possible. <clears throat> so this was the three species that uh, Philip II was asking for the, for the pools. <clears throat> and then uh, Felipe II had this Peter Jansson and Adrian de Molin, and he sent both of them separately to Bayonne to get the fish. He had two expeditions. Uh, using this safe, uh, safe passage, safe document. Uh, the thing is that Peter Hansen was put in prison in Bayonne for some uh, very nice story that it goes beyond this. So only Adrian was able to come back. <coughs> he went to Bayonne for the fish and then come back. But while being in Burgos, uh, he was uh, a cold winter and he was not able to 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 go farther with that many fish. So uh, uh, the abbot from the San Juan Monastery in Burgos informs the king that Adrian de Molin has been there and have led uh, 28 pikes and eight carps in the pool of the monastery. It seemed that he was able to go on with some fish because a few days later he arrived to Madrid with uh, some pikes and some carps and Pedro de Loyo, which was the secretary of works and forests, informs the king that he's very happy with the arrival. And amazingly for me, the king is even better informed but because he said, OK, I'm also happy, but he came with the pikes, but he only brought one carp, and the carp is dead, so he didn't brought any carp. And, the thing, and he goes on in a quite amazing way saying, and the fish that we put in the pool for the pike are too big for the pikes that he brought. So I'm telling you that someone has to go to the river and get a small fish to feed the pike. So it was, for me, it's amazing how informed the king was about these little uh, things. And a few days later, he sent, or he got the pike, uh, he got the pike amazingly, exactly to the same location where Icona took it <laughs> three, almost 500 years later. The Icona took the pike to, to to, I know, to, not to the Casa de Campo, to the other place, to the Anjuez. So it's basically the same pools where Felipe II took the, the pikes. Uh, it was where Icona took him that much time. But just as Adrian arrived, Felipe II said, okay, go back and, and get 
more fish from France. But this time, do not go into France because you will get into trouble. So stop at Fuente Rabia. And he goes, and some couple of months later, Adrián arrives to Madrid again with six alive carps and some tenches also that he's bringing. So we have also the introduction of the, of the carp. And what about the crayfish? They were not able to find them in, in Bayonne. They were said that some expedition was going to go to, to Bordeaux for the crayfish, but uh, not news about that. Philip II was trying to get the crayfish. He finally got it from Italy. And this is this letter from Simancas informing that uh, uh, some, uh, a lot of gambaros, which is in this case the, the Italian word for crayfish, have been sent in a ship uh, going from Livorno to, to Alicante and they would be taken then to, to Madrid or Aranjuez. So this is what uh, the archive documents tell us about the introductions of, of freshwater fish uh, in, in Spain. It is nice because uh, we were able to put a date for the introduction of the carp, that there was this myth that it was the Romans that took it. The Romans didn't even took the carp to Rome, so, so uh, less to Spain. And we can put a date for all this introduction. Have a look at the time, so, okay. I'll so the other source I want to talk about is the uh, historical newspapers. I, uh, it, there is also a huge amount of unused information in newspapers. They informed about everything and every single page is scanned and avail available. There's only a problem of, uh, of copyright. The publications that still have copyright are not uh, freely available. And I did a work with the, with the crayfish. The, after the introduction by the king, <coughs> the crayfish got, it took some time to be uh, taken by the population as a, as, a, as a food, basically. So after the 16th century, the next news we have, it is also relating with the royal family eating crayfish. And the first information that there exists about local populations eating crayfish is from the 18th century. And by the 19th century, the distribution of this Ostrepotemobius italicus looks like this. It was stocked in a lot of places. So in the 60s, it looked like this. And it kept uh, being introduced in many areas. And it collapsed in the 70s with the arrival of the, of the crayfish diseases that you probably know. <clears throat> so what I did is uh, search the 20th century newspapers for information on crayfish. And this is an example. This is the, the news for the introduction of the Australopotemobius italicus in Rivera del Huesnar, here in Cazalla de la Sierra. Or we have the inform this very nice information that is tell us how the Servicio Nacional de Pesca, which is the uh, previous to Icona, how this servicio introduced uh, Astacus Astacus crayfish, which is the, a different European species taken from from, from Germany and Britain and Anhuez, and they uh, released it in River Tajuña. There are some information on newspapers also on captures of this species some years later. So, so this was uh, an introduction that is often, often forgotten of freshwater crayfish. So this is how the number of uh, uh, newspaper news look like to, for the 20th century. I separate the Vanguardia and ABC because they have the best uh, individual newspapers, uh, hemerotecas, or uh, archives within, within Spain. But then there is uh, the figures for all the newspapers and the, for Vanguardia and ABC. <coughs> and from the newspapers, I was also, so uh, here there is a huge increase in the interest on, fresh water, uh, on crayfish. It is evident, and I was able to, to collect the prices paid for crayfish. So note that this is logarithmic, so by the time there was a huge increase in the price paid for crayfish, it arrived to something like 200, 250 euros a kilo. Uh, this is the flatted places, uh, prices, so this is taking into consideration the inflation. <clears throat> by that time, it was 
when the, the, the American crayfishes were introduced, so the, the uh, Italian crayfish collapsed, and these red dots are prices paid for Procambarus clarki for the red shrimp crayfish. So the first time the Procambarus clarki was sold in Madrid, it cost more than 100 euros a kilo. Uh, after only two or three years, it, it was basically the same price as at the beginning of the 20th century, because they were red shrimp crayfish everywhere. <coughs> so I, I, what I described so, was something like a, a double a vortex, one is an anthropogenic extinction vortex in which over-exploitation leads to increases in prices, which increases over-exploitation, which increase prices and go on, can go on until, until the extinction of a species. But then in the case of the crayfish, that uh, uh, does not happen in other animals, for example, there are no substitution for, for, the, for the horns of the elephants. But in the case of the crayfish, there was this possibility of substituting the species. So it was an, a vortex in the other sense that uh, led to the introduction of crayfish that in the first place were very, very expensive, that led people to take the crayfish everywhere and spread. And they, in very few years, from a very abundant crayfish species, we ended up having two different and different from the beginning, very abundant crayfish species, which are the red shrimp crayfish and the, and the saginal crayfish. And this is only to show how uh, we can get a lot of information from very different taxa from the newspapers, from a lot of mammals, a lot of fish, a lot of birds, and, and there is a, it's quite a hard work to go into the newspapers, but it's worse because the information is there. So just to finish, is I uh, tell that historical ecology approaches provide relevant information for ecological un un uh, understanding and the planning of conservation of biodiversity. That it, there is much more and much better historical information on biodiversity that, than generally assumed. And it is important to go interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or multi I never understand the differences between that. <laughs> but, but it is important to learn from what other people are doing in other fields because they allow us to go further in, in ecological understanding. So thank you very much for the attention. <laughs>